Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 121st episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Lord Summerisle and his followers from The Wicker Man. One of the earliest and greatest examples of cult horror, this film takes us on a journey through a society fully ingrained in an ancient lifestyle in a modern setting, one that harbors a dark plot to assure their prosperity at the expense of human life. In this video, we're going to explore everything we're given in the film and its literary adaptation about this world's leader, its people, and its culture, giving you the full picture of a fragile ecosystem that's been brought down to the foulest depths of desperation. Now without further ado, let's begin. To understand everything that we're about to discuss, it's important that you're familiar with the key aspects of this story. For those of you who aren't, I'm going to give you a short summary of it in just a moment, but I do recommend that you watch the film before continuing any further. In this story, we find a deeply pious Scottish policeman, one who's on a quest to solve the supposed murder of a girl named Rowan Morrison. This quest brings him to Summer Isle, an island just off the northwestern coast of Scotland that in this story is famed for its delectable produce. Throughout his investigation into this dreadful affair, our poor righteous constable Neil Howie becomes subject to a mystery of epically strange proportions, especially for a Christ-fearing Scotsman. And this mystery sees him unraveling a manufactured tale of a girl gone missing, one that was created specifically to draw him to Summer Isle. Once he comes to the pinnacle of his investigation, the islander's plot is revealed, and Howie is used as a sacrifice in their May Day festival the gift of his flesh being used to appease the gods of old that these people hope will bring about a bountiful harvest after the failure of their previous one. Now on the surface, why he's being sacrificed by the Summer Islanders is quite obvious, to give his life so their harvest might be bountiful. But the clues were given in both the film and the novel go a long way in explaining how an entire group of people arrived at the point where they'd be willing to do something so horrid. And it starts at the advent of Lord Summer Isle's clan's possession of this island. And we're given an explanation of their history by Lord Summer Isle when he's conversing with Officer Howie on the subject. You can find this history lesson in the film, however the novel gives us much greater detail. And I'll be reading what we can find there for you now. In the last century, the islanders were starving. Many were emigrating to Canada and Australia. Fishing and sheep brought in a marginal income, much as it does today on our neighboring islands. But mullet and mutton, so to speak, are hardly the counters of prosperity. Dutifully, every Sunday, the people, Baptist and Catholic, Presbyterian and Freekirk, bowed as low as their respective religions permitted to the Christian God and prayed for prosperity. But inevitably, none appeared. In due course, they came to realize that their reward was to be either in the colonies or, as the various priests indicated in a rare moment of agreement, in heaven. Then in 1868, my great-grandfather bought this barren island and set about changing things. He was a distinguished Victorian scientist, agronomist, and free thinker. Look at his face. How formidably benevolent he seems, essentially the face of a man incredulous of all human good. Lord Summer Isle indicated a large oil painting, hanging in the place of honor, above the fireplace. Howie rose and looked at the picture with distaste. It showed a haughty Victorian figure of Lord Summer Isle's stature, but with a face almost entirely obscured by mustache, eyebrows, and whiskers. You are very cynical, my lord, was all Howie could find to say. I simply know my family, sergeant, said Lord Summer Isle, but let me show you what he did. He steered the sergeant away from the picture and towards a door at the far end of the room. Together they marched through a huge dining room and out onto a terrace garden facing the sea. What had attracted my great-grandfather to the island, apart from the profuse source of wiry labor that it promised, was the unique combination of volcanic soil and the warm gulf stream that surrounded it. He paused for Howie to take in the feckin' scene. Palm trees nodded in the breeze, and a magnolia was in full bloom. You see, Sergeant, continued Lord Summer Isle, his experiments had led him to believe that it was possible to induce here the successful growth of certain new strains of fruit that he had developed. Howie gazed around at a row of glass cases, containing here a growing graft, there a shrunken apple, apricot, or pear, with its history plainly marked beside it. Clearly this was a kind of museum dedicated to Lord Summer Isle's family's achievement. And so you see, Lord Summer Isle was saying, with typical mid-Victorian zeal, my great-grandfather set to work. But of course, almost immediately, he met opposition from the fundamentalist ministers, who threw tons of his artificial fertilizer into the harbor on the grounds that if God had meant us to use it, he'd have provided it. My great-grandfather took exactly the same view of ministers, and he realized he had to find a way to be rid of them. 
the best method of accomplishing this, it seemed to him, was to rouse the people by giving them back their joyous old deities. So he encouraged, as it were, a retreat down memory lane, backwards from Christianity, through the ages of reason and belief, to the age of mysticism. No, these islanders needed little urging. My great-grandfather simply told them about the stones, how they, in fact, formed an ancient temple, and that he, the lord of the manor, would make a sacrifice there every day to their old gods and goddesses, particularly those of fertility and fruitfulness, and that as a result of this worship, Lord Summerisle sounded more and more as if he were talking from a pulpit. His gestures were sweeping, as if he were addressing his islanders en masse, as how he had no doubt he often did. The barren island would burgeon and bring forth fruit in great abundance. For an atheist, great-grandfather had a singularly biblical turn of phrase, don't you think? Well, of course, at first, people worked for him because he fed and clothed them. Then naturally, when all the trees started fruiting, it became a different story. The ministers told the people to withdraw their labor, as they were trucking with the devil. My great-grandfather told the people that if they did so, he would leave and the island would become as barren again as all the others. In this way, the old gods appear to have defeated the Christian god, and the ministers fled the island never to return. But how did the trees come to fruit when so many other attempts to grow things on these islands have failed? Don't tell me your great-grandfather really worshipped the gods of fertility. Howie almost spat out the phrase. Come, come, sergeant, said Lord Summerisle patiently. As I've already told you, he worshipped science. What he did, of course, was to develop new cultivars of hardy fruits to suit local conditions. Out here we have his original experimental orchard, much developed, of course. Now with all this backstory, we're given quite the insight into just how important religion actually is to the lords of Summer Isle, and that is to say, not at all. The advent of ancient pagan religion upon this island was nothing more than a clever ploy by a brilliant man to both eliminate his competition in the form of Christian ministers and assure the loyalty of his populace through his implementation of and adherence to a system that, as far as they knew, brought them immense fortune. And as the current Lord Summerisle remarks during this conversation, it was quite the easy feat to accomplish. The people, said Lord Summerisle, were persuaded that your god, the god of the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims had become less powerful than the old gods who still lived on in the woods, and the water, and the fire, and the stone. That's how, after 1600 years, you're joking, laughed Howie. For the first time in their interview, Lord Summerisle looked angry. Howie decided to humor him. Who did it then? Who persuaded them? He asked dutifully. My great-grandfather, actually, said Lord Summerisle. It wasn't all that difficult. The tradition of the arcane and the mysterious cleaves to the people of this island with a tenacity that makes it seem an inherent and inalienable possession. They are Celts, after all. He makes quite the point, as how much worth is the supposed divinity of a man long dead, born in far-off Israel, claiming to be the Son of God, in comparison to the miracles you see occurring right before your eyes. When you live in a barren wasteland that is then transformed into a bountiful paradise, one that's decorated by the symbols of the gods that once laid claim to these lands, this makes a much more convincing argument than any text ever could. Thus, in a masterstroke of genius, the first Lord of Summer Isle assured the prosperity of his family for generations to come, so long as they made use of his scientific work and towed the line of paganism. And indeed they did, as Summer Isle, at the time of this story, is a veritable paradise, one free from crime and poverty that provides for every living soul that treads its soil. Living is a key distinction here. However, we'll get to the dead in just a moment. First, let's talk a bit more about this faith and the people who practice it. Centered around the cycle of life and reincarnation, the Summer Island religion is mainly concerned with that which gives life and nurtures it, the reproductive cycle. Throughout all levels of life on this island are found sexual and mystical symbols, lessons in school, songs in taverns, foreskins in the apothecary shop, and fertility rituals undertaken by young women around a fire in the midst of a stone circle. Needless to say, the island is rife with them. So with these things in mind, is there anything necessarily wrong about the way these people practice their faith? Maybe. Centering your society around the reproductive cycle isn't a bad thing, as sex 
and reproduction are quite a big part of life. But this is only okay, as long as it isn't exploiting anyone's mental and physical well-being, bodily autonomy, or free will. And while that sentiment applies to all people, it's more so important that the youth aren't exploited in this way. And whether or not the children of Summer Isle are, is up for debate. There are a few moments in the novel, and in the film, that might call into question these people's grooming of children into sexual acts at a young age. And while any society is free to operate as they wish, I think, or rather hope, that everyone watching this video can agree that this type of moral foundation is deplorable and heinous. We're never given any concrete indication that any abuse or coerced adolescent copulation is occurring. And if the Summer Islanders are only teaching their children to embrace their sexuality rather than fear it, as many societies do, that's a different story, as this would be equivalent to having sexual education class, but instead of it being one class, you're given a constant education in it but I'm not sure what their true intentions and actions are. So what do you think? Is this type of evil ingrained within the people of Summer Isle, or are they free thinkers? Let me know down below. So this is essentially how this society operates, but now let's take a look to see how the reigning monarch of Summer Isle chooses to embrace his religion. Now as you heard earlier, Lord Summer Isle is quite aware that he owes his and his family's success to scientific innovation. Even if that's the case though, it would seem that the current Lord Summer Isle has in part taken to the beliefs that his atheistic progenitor used as a tool to control his holdings. During that same conversation I quoted earlier, we're given a bit of insight into Lord Summer Summer Isle's personal feelings regarding his religion, and they're given to us when he comments on the girls dancing naked around the bonfire in the stone circle. They do so enjoy their divinity lessons, he said, gazing out the window with an affectionate smile. But they're naked, cried Howie. Naturally, said Lord Summer Isle reasonably, it's much too dangerous to leap through a fire with your clothes on. What kind of religion can they possibly be learning, jumping over bonfires naked, demanded Howie. Parthenogenesis, said Lord Summer Isle, ringing the word out in his beautiful voice. Literally, as Miss Rose would doubtless explain, in her assiduous way, reproduction without sexual union. What nonsense is this? Maddened by this smug lord of the manor telling him, Neil Howie, about religion, of all things. You've got fake biology, fake religion. Sir, have these children never heard of Jesus? Himself the son of a virgin impregnated, I believe, by a ghost, said Lord Summer Isle very quietly, but distinctly. Howie not only looked outraged, but was dumbfounded. Lord Summer Isle motioned him to a chair. Do sit down, he said to the sergeant. Shocks are so much better absorbed with the knees bent. And he smiled at Howie's bewildered face. Oh yes, sergeant, said Lord Summer Isle. Even Christians believe in parthenogenesis. As for those children out there, they're leaping through the flames in the hope that the god of the fire may make them fruitful. And really, you know, you can hardly blame them. After all, what girl would not prefer the child of a god to that of some acne-scarred artisan? And you encourage all this rubbish, my lord, asked Howie. It's most important, Lord Summer Isle was saying, that each new generation born on Summer Isle be made aware that here, the old gods aren't dead. But what of the true god to whose glory monasteries and churches have been built on these islands over the centuries? What of him? How he could not help asking. Oh, he's dead all right. Lord Summer Isle said it thoughtfully, but with conviction. And he can't complain. He had his chance, and, in modern parlance, blew it. Now these passionate arguments, and his participation in all aspects of religious life on his island, are an indicator of Lord Summer Isle's faith. But again, we learned earlier that he is fully aware of science's contribution to his people's prosperity. So it begs the question of just how pious this man truly is. If I had to guess, I'd say his upbringing, as well as the romance associated with the stories, songs, and dances of this religion, have given him sentimental feelings. Feelings that anyone living their life in a positive environment would feel. And if he isn't a true believer, he's certainly a man who enjoys his beliefs and the culture that they've created. However, his scientific knowledge isn't the only thing that calls into question this man's faith, but the way he reacts to the words of Sergeant Howie just before he's sent up to the wicker man to be sacrificed, which is the true definitive evil of this story. Lord Summer Isle's faithlessness is implied in both the film and the book when Sergeant Howie remarks that sacrificing him won't save their crops, and more so, 
When it doesn't, that they'll be forced to offer another sacrifice, asking these people how many would need to come after him in order for the crops to grow once more. This line of thinking unnerves Lord Summerisle. He knows full well that it was his ancestor's scientific ingenuity that caused this island to prosper, not the worship of any god, and it's this knowledge that gives him the designation of being the prime evil amongst an entire community that have gathered to commit an evil act. For it's not the promise of a sacrificial boon that has spurned Lord Summerisle to involve his entire community in a murderous plot, but the illusion that that boon will be granted. If the crops continue to fail, Lord Summerisle and his family will be taken for liars and conmen, and the very fabric of their society would crumble should that happen. So, Lord Summerisle has likely been hard at work, figuring out ways to boost his crops through scientific means. And in order to ensure his island's continued faith in him, as well as the gods that have now become central to their prosperity, he uses Sergeant Howie's sacrifice as a means to convince his people that their faith is true, and that they can continue to count on Lord Summerisle as the herald of that faith, keeping him happy and wealthy for some time to come. But no matter the circumstances surrounding this sacrificial rite, it's still monstrously evil, and it can in no way be excused or forgiven. Now as I mentioned earlier, it's every person's right to practice whatever religion they want to, or to not practice one at all. And furthermore, it's those individuals' right to congregate with one another, and that's how many of the world's societies were formed. However, a large majority of these religions and societies were created long ago, and as a consequence, most, if not all of the religions that can trace their lineages back thousands of years, condone some pretty grisly practices. You can find horrid things within the sacred texts of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and even Buddhism, and you can definitely find horrid things that people who practice paganism did throughout our history a sample of which were given in this story. With that in mind, it's not so much the Summer Islanders' religion that's the problem in this film. It's their willingness to adhere to the more archaic aspects of their religion. Any non-fundamentalist, level-headed, modern practitioner of any of the religions I listed above would never dream of abusing others because of their religion, and it's perfectly fine for a person to hold those beliefs as long as they have the wherewithal to not tread the same path that their ancestors might have, because violence is still violence, and murder is still murder, even if you cloak it in the holy raiment of your gods. And that above all else that the Summer Islanders are is what dooms them to darkness. The fact that an entire populace is so entrenched within their beliefs that they're completely willing to be complicit in the murder of another human being so their society might prosper. And who knows how many have had to make the same sacrifice since the first Lord Summer Isle set foot on the island. In the end, this is a lesson in the dangerous power that a people shown prosperity through divinity can hold. And though this island may be full of smiling faces, dancing bodies, and voices heralding the sweet onset of summer, each and every one of them are nothing more than vessels holding souls warped by evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on the Wicker Man? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.